You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My conversation today is going to be about prediction markets. So before I bring on today's guest, I thought I'd give you a little background about prediction markets, what they are, a little bit of their origins, and what they do. So a prediction market is essentially gambling. It's something that allows people to bet on future outcomes. Importantly, it allows many people to bet on really anything. The thing about a market is that through exchange, through many people exchanging on a large market, buying and selling and evaluating, they converge on a price that reflects the the knowledge and the, the level of certainty of all the participants. If I think some asset is going to have a future value of $10 and you think it's going to have a future value of $5, we are both going to try to exchange. If you have that asset, you will sell it to me because I value it more highly. I would put a higher value on it. And one of us is going to be right, or perhaps neither of us. But in any case, if my evaluation is wrong, I may lose my shirt. If your evaluation is right, you will gain. And there's a selection between market participants, and that selection leads the most prescient, those with the greatest foresight, to have the largest impact on the price so that that price can reflect accurately future conditions to the extent that they can be predicted. Now, this happens in markets all the time. Any sort of durable good, if it's, say, pig iron, if I think the price of pig iron is going to be higher later than it is now, higher even than the price now plus, plus interest, then I, what I do is I buy pig iron at today's price. I store, stockpile it in a warehouse somewhere, and then I sell it later at the higher price. And so long as that you know, difference in price is large enough to justify the costs of storing it and, of course, the costs of not having it for productive uses now, then I'll earn money. It's the way the economy regulates the use of its resources across time. But what about something that is not, like pig iron, durable? Something like rice. Rice goes bad. Well, the first futures market was in was started in Dojima, Japan, centuries ago, and it was a rice futures market. And what that meant was that rather than trading, you know, I come to the market with a sack of rice and I sell it to you for some price, instead, I come to the market agreeing to sell you a sack of rice eight months in the future, ten months in the future. Most likely, I I would be a farmer and I would have a rice crop that I was just planting, and the thing about being able to trade on a futures exchange is that then I no longer have to bear the risk of changes in the price of rice. It's the person who agrees to buy at a certain price in the future who bears that risk. And so there's a division of labor. There are people who know a lot about farming but are not very good at forecasting the future price of rice. And then there are people who maybe are not very good at farming, farming but they have some insight into what the future price of rice will be. So that's a futures market, and it's sort of a somewhat artificial way of bringing markets and trade into forecasting in a way that they might not have been otherwise. Otherwise, the farmers themselves would have to do their own forecasting. So there's a modern invention that is like a futures exchange, but instead of a futures exchange... It's a prediction market, and it can be for anything. For instance, there was a website called Intrade that was a prediction market, and it was around during the 2012 election, and people could bet on whether Barack Obama or Mitt Romney was going to be elected president. In fact, they could bet on every, every election in every district, and the prices that emerged on Intrade were extremely accurate, much more accurate than, for instance, just looking at current poll numbers. 
at any given moment in time. And those prices, the market itself was zero sum. If I made a bet and you, you took up my bet and one of us wins, the other loses, it's t- zero sum. Nobody, there's no net benefit to society from our bet just directly, but there, there is a net benefit to society or to others of having that price information, of knowing the odds, the best odds that the market participants can come up with that the given event will occur. So if you had a business and you wanted to, you felt that your business prospects under one president would be very different from under the other, you could refer to the prices on Intrade to help you make your business decisions. And there's that division of labor. Rather than hiring your own expert to forecast who's going to win this election, and I don't know why your the president would affect your business. Maybe maybe Mitt Romney was going to come in and cut your subsidy, or or maybe Barack Obama was going to come in and regulate it, you out of business. But rather than hiring your own expert, the experts go to this prediction market and they they gamble, and some of them win, some of them lose. There's the selection process, and these prices converge to the best prediction of the market participants. And you can have a prediction market in anything. As we'll mention in the interview, if you're Microsoft, you could have a prediction market that says, if we fire our CEO, what will our share price be in five years? Something like that. That is some very relevant information. It's something Microsoft would be very interested to know. And they could just create this prediction market and learn from the people who have the best information or who think they have the best information and who are willing to put their money where their mouths are. I mentioned Intrade. Intrade was eventually shut down in 2013. First, U.S. customers, bettors, were blocked from the site. It was run out of Ireland. And then eventually it was shut down entirely because of... It was shut down because of anti-gambling laws that originated from before there even was an in-trade or or a prediction market, these antiquarian laws that came and shut it down. Now, what do you do when there's an ever-present hazard hanging over a business model? In this case, if you have a prediction market and you set it up on a central server somewhere, you could always be shut down by the government that has jurisdiction over your server, wherever it physically is. Or if you're incorporated out of a certain place, you could be have your business license revoked. You could be regulated out of existence. How do you get around that? It's no different than a natural disaster, in a sense. You have to somehow mitigate its effect. Well, my next guest has an idea. My guest today is Zach Hess. He is working on a project called TruthCoin, which is a decentralized prediction market based on the technology behind Bitcoin. Zach, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Hi, Garrett. Thanks for uh, having me on today. I'm really excited to talk about TruthCoin and hopefully get some beta testers out of your audience. Yeah, well, you never know. So let's start out with a little background on yourself. Uh, How did you get involved in this project? Well, I had been majoring in physics, but um, I was always looking into uh, Bitcoin in my spare time. So then I ended up dropping out about a year ago and um, got really attached to this uh, TruthCoin project written by Paul. And I've been working on it uh, with all my time since then. Interesting. So so you have some programming background, presumably. I did a little bit of programming before this, like recreationally in my spare time. I think, I think most of my audience is going to be familiar with Bitcoin, and at least in a general sense. It's, they, they know it's some kind of digital money. But... I think most of us are somewhat mystified by the technology behind it. We know it's something called the, the blockchain. Could you explain that and how it works? Well, the quality of the blockchain that uh, is really important, it, it acts kind of like a horcrux from uh, Harry Potter. The, the idea is instead of having one server, um, and if the server got shut down, the, server, the, the, the website would get shut down. There was like thousands of computers. And if even one of the computers is still on, then you can still access the website. So, so unlike, you know, one of the websites I might have logged into in the year, you know, 2002 or something, which would occupy, you know, physical server space somewhere, like a, a big server in a building somewhere, this is more, it's like peer-to-peer, it's sort of like a 
torrent or uh, that that's the kind of technology? It acts a lot like a lot more like a torrent. Okay. So, uh, like in trade for it was a like it was a traditional website. It had a single server. And that was why it was able to get shut down, because once the one ser- server got shut down, the whole website got shut down. Right, right. That w- they, they operated out of Ireland, I think. And, yeah, they, you know, they... At, at Even first... escaping the country is not enough. You got to... They'll still get the signs and shut down your website. Right. And I believe with the, the death of Intrade, they were sort of... First, the U.S. customers were blocked out, and then the whole show was shut down. Um, so the, so sort of the reason we have things like torrents and then Bitcoin and potentially in the future, truth coin, uh, being operated in these sort of peer to peer, uh, decentralized ways is because they're specifically the things that governments would want to shut down, like illegal downloading, uh, and private currency and also prediction markets. Yeah, that's pretty much the, the whole reason to have put something on a blockchain is to make it so that no one can ever shut it down, ever. So uh, let's let's get into the sort of, uh, like, just the basics of the blockchain. If I'm mining Bitcoin, how, how am I contributing to the... So my, my computer is then, you know, a node in this sort of co- large number of this network that somehow manages Bitcoin? Mining is how um, Bitcoin maintains security because it's a proof-of-work style blockchain. But there's many different consensus mechanisms. And um, I don't know, I don't think it's that critical how the consensus me- uh, mechanism works. Okay, so, so there are different ways of sort of decentralizing this process. Um, yeah, the proof-of-work way is really expensive. So we're actually considering going with a proof-of-stake could you explain that? Well, with a with a proof of work blockchain, you got to spend like Bitcoin. They spend eight hundred thousand dollars every day to keep it secure, and uh, the holders that's given to the miners, which dilutes the full money supply because they're basically printing more money. Um, so if you're holding Bitcoins, you'd notice a little bit of inflation, and your money would lose value. Uh, the proof of stake is an alternative mechanism that doesn't require printing tons of money. Well, let's let's uh, let's talk a little bit about prediction markets and give a little background. Markets, there's there was an ins the insight from Mises and Hayek in the socialist calculation debate was that markets, uh, in addition to the the benefits just from exchange itself, when you have a complex set of markets all trading in terms of uh, in terms of money, you get this array of prices that then provides valuable information to to really anyone who can who can observe the prices and who can then uh, act on the on the information that they provide about the relative scarcity of different goods uh, yeah the, prices totally tell you about the relative value of things the idea with a prediction market then is to create a market in something that uh, the market itself is not particularly valuable it's sort of like a you know a craps table just gambling but then the you get the price from it, which then and that tells is you about the real world. For instance, it could be the percentage chance that ale is going to fall on a particular ale uh, on a particular acre of uh, grain that year. Right, or the chance that Mitt Romney is going to be elected in twenty twelve, uh, which was yeah. When so there's basically two people that are going to use a prediction market. There's people who have questions they want answered. And there's people who want to gamble because they think they know the answers to those questions. So it's it's sort of a way of finding people who not only believe uh, that they know, you know, that have valuable information about the future, but who are willing to put their money where their mouth is. Yeah, and that's why prediction markets are um, the best possible aggregator of information uh, from a group a, a group of humans. So, they give you the most accurate results. Right, and and uh, I believe, yeah, Intrade was still up during the 2012 election, as I, uh, I mentioned, and it was remarkably accurate predicting who was going to win, not just the presidency, but every dis- district and every sort of... Uh, and it's not just that one situation. Prediction markets are always better than professionals. Right. If you If you have one person who's an expert and says this is going to happen, 
Uh, they're, the expert's going to do worse on average in the prediction market. They're, they're, because the prediction market ultimately combines many experts and, and, you know, unexpected experts, people who maybe have special knowledge but don't, you know, don't have the credentials to show up on on the nightly news and tell people what the future is supposedly going to be. So about prediction markets, we should talk about market manipulation when someone tries to get a prediction market to say a lie about the future. Right. So, yes, people people do have an incentive to lie. And, of course, that, that expert on the nightly news uh, may have some sort of horse in the game, for instance, predicting that uh, your candidate is going to win an election may affect who actually wins the election? If it was to work really well, companies might ask, which one of these people should be our CEO? And then those CEOs will, will be able to bet in the market about themselves. And if I'm a potential CEO and I put up $100,000, is the, the idea is that uh, other people will, will see that and arbitrage it away? So if you bet on a lie... If you like, uh, if I made a prediction market saying two plus two equals four, and then I bet that it, w- it w- that two plus two equals five instead, and I put a ton of money on it, and it looked like there's a 99 percent chance that two plus two equals five. Well, all that money I put there is the prize for other people to come and be honest. They can take all that money that I put there. Okay, and but in in the two plus two equals five case. Who who eventually comes and says that it actually equals four? Uh, you need you need. There's this issue of arbitration. Uh, so if someone comes with a dollar and they bet that two plus two equals four are against me, then they'll win back two dollars. Right. Because uh, they're right for sure. When when eventually the the market is resolved, so the market would not be just two plus two equals four. It would be. 2 plus 2 is going to equal 4 on a certain date in the future, right? Sure. The the point where where the trades are, where the money actually leaves your pocket and goes into someone else's if you lose. The concept I'm trying to relate is that um, attempts to manipulate the market just create a bigger reward for people to be honest. So attempts to manipulate the market actually make the market more accurate. Hmm. That's kind of a counterintuitive... Result. Because you're putting more money into it, you're, you're making it a bigger reward. So, so my, so my attempt to manipulate, because it pays other people to come into the market. So, a market with only five dollars or thirty dollars being bet in it. There's not much of a prize. It's not even worth people's time to to read what it says. Right. But then, then if if I come in with a hundred thousand dollars because I really want the market to say one thing. That that brings that in all, everyone else. Thousand dollar prize for people to be honest. So, with Truthcoin, Truthcoin is different from Intrade. Like you said, Intrade was a single server, and Truthcoin is a large decentralized sort of network. With Intrade, Intrade was both they both created the market, and then they arbitrated the the trades or the the bets. So. When when the news came up that uh, Barack Obama had been reelected, someone on the Intrade staff looked at that and then paid out the the bets to the people who had bet on Barack Obama. But who who's performing that uh, role That's with something the like Truthcoin? That's the most difficult uh, problem in, in Truthcoin. You're right. The problem of telling the blockchain the, the result that happened in the real world. Um, and this problem was solved by a man named Paul Stork. Uh, and uh, I read his solution and wrote it in the code. The idea is to, um, th- there's a, a team, there's like a jury of people who vote on the decision, mm-hmm. and they vote on multiple decisions at the same time. And since they're voting on multiple decisions, each person will have more of an incentive to lie in some of the decisions than others. Okay. Ra- rather than having someone just arbitrate one question, they arbitrate many questions, some of which they might have a personal connection to, but others they're certainly not going to have a personal connection to. Correct. And then by looking at the matrix of votes that's happened, the multiple decisions, multiple voters, we're able to, um, we, 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 reward, we reward people who are honest and punish people who are dishonest. So the, they're trying to trick each other into voting wrong. 
And since they're all trying to trick each other into voting wrong all the time, it's impossible for them to ever collude and um, team up to cheat. Okay, so so it's 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 like you're sitting in in a class and you're graded on a curve. You're not going to pass notes back and forth with the other students about what the right answers are because right. the, their higher grade is your loss. Yes. And besides the existence of the jury, um, anyone, if they buy enough truth coins, um, they can burn some of the truth coins and create a new jury, which is a, a pile of uh, a new, like, it's a colored coin. And um, you send these colored coins to a bunch of people, and then those are the members of the jury to vote on stuff. So, so a... So let's see. Some, I don't think you've mentioned yet what a truth coin is. Is it like a bitcoin? Yes, a truth coin is the unit of value. Um, they might be called cash coins. It's the unit of value on the truth coin blockchain. And do they do they convert? Can I convert my or you know once it once it's all up and running, could I convert my truth coin to a bitcoin or or sell it for a dollar or? Or something much, like that. Much like trading for uh, bitcoins or litecoins, trading between any alt currencies is pretty similar. You'd go onto an exchange and you'd trade the bitcoins for the truth coins, and you, you can also trade bitcoins for dollars. So you'd be able to get back out to dollars too. But suppose the value of truth coins were to fluctuate, would that change the value of all the bets? Yes. Long-term bets at first are going to be totally impossible because the value of truth coins is going to fluctuate too fast. So we're focusing on short-term bets at first until the value stabilizes. Okay. When I make a bet, is it would it always be a yes or a no, a right or wrong, and I get everything if I win and nothing if I lose? Or is there a potential for the kind of bet where we're betting on, like, uh, maybe the percentage growth rate of GDP and I get you know, more of the pot depending on how high the percentage is. So I might, if GDP was at 2%, I might get 60% of the of the pot. But if it was at 3%, I might get 80%, something more complex like that. Well, one thing we do offer, there's, all the decisions are binary. Okay. But you can connect the decisions together in combinatory ways, and you can bet on the correlation between different binary decisions. Okay, so so I just need to... So the technology itself, in its most basic form, does not let me have more complex sort of trades that uh, allow me to bet on, uh, you know, in in a way that is not just simply binary, but by combining well, binary let me, let me give you an example of what's on the edge of what we can do. Okay. You, we can create a whole bunch of bets at once so that if the value of Truthcoin were to go down, you win some more bets. And if the value of Truthcoin were to go up, you lose some more bets so that you have a crypto asset which maintains constant value with respect to the U.S. dollar. Okay. So so that might, if, if I was able to hedge in terms of that asset, the, the uh, hedged truth coin, then could I then also make bets and long, longer-term bets that were themselves hedged? You could, but um, there's a margin call on this tool. So you might not want to wait a huge amount of time. Okay. And the wider you put the margins, you actually get uh, a worse deal, you know? Okay. So the, what, what is the this current state of this project? It's, it's not out there for everyone to use. It's, uh, you mentioned beta testers before. So it's in, in beta, is it? There's a blockchain up. If you download the code, you can connect to the blockchain. Um, you can mine blocks. You can give money to people. Um, we can bet on stuff. But uh, it's probably going to crash again in the next few days. There's still a lot of security holds, and uh, it's not going to be able to hold value for another uh, few months at least. Do, do you see a potential for um, other competing Truthcoin equivalents, other competing betting markets to, to enter? Just, just like Bitcoin was sort of the first big cryptocurrency, and now there's Litecoin and there's Quark and other things. Yeah, I think this is this is a market that's going to grow. It's going to grow big and fast, and there's going to be a lot of people competing for it. Because there's really two things you can do with money: you can like have it for spending, or you can invest it. And something like ninety percent of money is invested. This is the first time you can invest without trusting a third party. Okay, so rather than putting my money in a bank or a mutual fund, where I have to trust the banker or the or the manager of the 
of the fund, I could I could have my money in in truth coin, and I could, well, let's see. I, I mean, a mutual fund is a bet on the value of the the stocks or the assets in the fund. So could I then take truth coin and just bet make bets on the on the value of those assets and have an equivalent portfolio? Yeah, yeah, you could make bets yourself, but it's it's pretty difficult. I think a lot of people are going to um, uh, watch how someone else invests and set a program to do the same, or you might still go to a bank and find a professional to invest your money, but the professional will use will use the truth coin to to save money. And once once of course this gets off the ground. Uh, I think for while while in trade was up while there were betting more be- betting markets out there you'd turn on the news and they would quote these markets they would say oh you know the the market you know Mitt Romney said this and the market you know dropped 10% from his chance of of victory and I just, I thought that was so interesting because rather because that was something really tangible uh that that they could that they could tell you about what likely was going to occur not just speculation but speculation by people with skin in the game and yeah i think it's really exciting that eventually we're going to have prediction markets that we know will be around and that's really the the big issue that unlike something like in trade which can which a government can come along and shut down truthcoin once it's out there once it's working if it's if it's bug free I could I could bet on it being around for a long time, and once it has like a high volume of traders and and maybe a fairly stable value, I can bet on some outcome that may not happen, you know, for a few years down the road, and know that one truth coin will be around, and two its value will be fairly stable. Yeah, I'm really excited for long term bets on global warming. Yes. That, that that'll be interesting. I think there's a lot of a lot of lies going on, and there's a lot of incentives to lie. Right. And there's a lot of that's in, involved with medicine that we uh, that should be done. Right. So yeah, with something like climate change, a lot of the the people who know enough to comment on it also have you know their grant money comes in at about the rate you know it, the the worse their predictions, the more uh, money gets funneled into funneled into their research. So it's 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 hard. I mean, they they obviously know more about the science than I do, but at the same time, they have an incentive to mislead me. So I'm left not really knowing what the right answers are. But if there's a prediction market, then people have to be honest. I think if there had been a prediction market in the you know past ten years, there's this this idea of the the global warming pause, where the pattern has not held for for a decade, and you know that that does not mean that it it won't you know then unpause at some point but a lot of people would have lost their shirts say making some of the more bold predictions about yeah, it's true this decade there's a, some big opportunities to make money in the last in the last couple of decades on global warming if the prediction market had existed and what what sort of what other things would you would you uh, expect uh, there to be sort of vibrant prediction markets in? Well, hopefully like uh, political things and um, businesses that have questions. Uh, Google. Google's got a prediction market that they use to, to figure out when um, their projects are going to be completed. Oh, okay. And so people who work at Google, they've got a little, a little better knowledge than most people so that they can reveal that information and make money that way. I think that's one of the more, more popular uses. But um, for catching politicians when they lie is pretty good. Obama promised he would shut down um, Guantanamo Bay, and that's a pretty uh, easy thing to bet on. Will Guantanamo Bay be uh, open in two years versus will Obama get elected? Okay, so so not only do you know some someone like you or I creates a prediction market just and and then some third party interested in the topic looks at it, but that third party could actually create it themselves. Is what you're saying about about Google? Oh, oh yes, anyone can create prediction markets on Truthcoin. They can ask any question. So Microsoft could could ask a question like, you know, what will Mike, Microsoft's stock be in two years? The share price be in two years, given that we do this. Yes. Or or given that we do that. That's exactly what I'm expecting. And 
right? That's a, that's an idea that's pushed a lot by uh, Robin Hanson. Yeah, he, he Robin Hanson came up with futarchy. Yes, the the idea of futarchy. Could could you explain that for the audience? All right. So the idea of futarchy is that so there's this politician I know. He's my grandfather. And he, he's uh, a politician for a community like 20,000 people, but he still has to make decisions, like uh, where are they going to put gardens and who's allowed to use the community garden. And it, it's tough for him because if he makes the wrong decision, they'll blame him. So I told him about the prediction market, and he says that he would love something like that because he doesn't have to take the risk of making the decision himself. He can just look at the prediction market and do what's best, and they, they can't blame him later. So the... the... So the betting, just to to make it clear, we you might bet on something like. Well, what uh, what Robin Hanson says is you create some kind of index of of well being, that like a backward looking index of how happy people were, you know, in in twenty thirteen or or something like that. Well, if you want to bet about happiness, but if you cared about something else, if you cared about how many people were killed in war, you could bet on that. If you cared about how many people are in prison, you could bet on that. Okay, so so whatever cares to you, whatever you care about as a person. Okay, so if it's you know it's two thousand one, it's after nine eleven, and in this, and let's say that uh, prediction markets already existed in the you know just do an alternate reality, people could bet on the number of American casualties if. Uh, George W. Bush invaded Afghanistan. Yeah, and we could bet on um, how, what are the uh, consequences of not invading, or are the threats really as big as George Bush claims they are? Right. So another, you know, maybe maybe d- deaths from terrorism if George W. Bush does not invade Afghanistan, and people bet on that, and we and we look at that and go, oh, okay. So if he doesn't invade, we're expecting. So, so, you know, this number of deaths, and if he does invade, we're expecting, you know, that number of deaths, and, you know, maybe maybe we maybe we look at that, and maybe it changes our decision about whether, whether to pursue one policy or another. The politicians are kind of forced to do what the prediction market thinks is best, because everyone is able to watch the politician make mistakes. Everyone's aware of the mistakes that the prediction market exists. So, I'm a politician... If I do what the prediction market says, then I can say, hey, everybody thought this because, you know, look at the prediction markets. The traders themselves who had money in the game thought this and all the news personalities who were quoting the prediction market values thought this. You can't blame me. And then if they did the opposite of what the prediction market thought and things went badly or were perceived to go badly, then they could, you know, they, then ev- everyone knows that they c- they could have known better that they that they had information at the time saying don't do this it won't turn out well. Yeah, that's exactly right. Futarchy is a way better uh, method of achieving anarchy than all the other methods proposed because the politicians themselves have an incentive to follow along. The, I guess the what, what you're getting at there is that under futarchy it is the market that determines what policy is. Yeah. If if the politicians uh, go with what the market thinks is best, depending on any sort of given measure, then effectively, we we it's sort of an end run around politicians. They they are just sort of neutral passers on of market decisions. Like when the queen became a figurehead, we're going to turn our politicians into figureheads too. Inter- okay, so so it's sort of a, you're you're seeing it as sort of a modern day. Uh, Magna Carta, sort of yeah. transfer of power away from away from the the politicians themselves, but without removing them, without getting rid of them. Yes, like the church, it used to kill tons of people all the time, and these days the churches don't don't kill as many people. It's less dangerous than it used to be. Hopefully, Truthcoin can help make the government less dangerous too. Interesting. Yeah, I I hadn't thought of that. So just by creating it. You, it's it's like you give markets a loudspeaker, uh, a sort of bully pulpit. So that that was, I think, the weakness. I had read about futarchy, and I thought this is a great idea. But who's going to enact it? Who's who's going to voluntarily say 
yes, we, we will now enact whatever policy the prediction market uh, thinks is best, but we don't actually need anyone to, to enact it. We just need them to bow to the pressure from from this very sort of public display of, of belief among market participants. Uh-huh. And it'll take a while for people to start really trusting the prediction market, but I think it's an inevitable process. Do, do, you, uh, do you ever regret leaving physics for this? No, not at all. That's great. It's, it's great that you're passionate. I'm trying to, trying to change the world and make it a better place. It's way better than physics. Great. My guest today has been Zach Hess. Zach, where can people find you online? Um, well, you should probably go to the, the GitHub page for this project. You can try it out. Uh, Zach.Bitcoin is my... Zach-Bitcoin is my GitHub name. And uh, the repository is truthcoin POW. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on. this episode of Economics Detective Radio, you can head over to economicsdetective.com for additional content and links. The music for this podcast was created by Cassandra McLeod, who you can find at soundcloud.com under the stage name Minaret. That's M-I-N-A space R-E-T. Minaret.